Hello there, AP World History people. Let's keep learning about decolonization. So, this is officially the end of the Age of Imperialism. We're after World War II, and all kinds of people in Africa and Asia have had enough of imperial governments controlling them, so they're demanding their independence. And in this post-World War II world, they are absolutely getting it. Some countries negotiated their independence, and other countries fought bloody wars for their freedom. It was a very different experience depending on the country, so I'm going to talk about a lot of those right now. All right, and here's a map of the world. It shows you all the uh, years which they came independent, but I think you could pretty confidently say most countries got their independence in either the 1950s or 1960s. That seems to be the, the two decades of true decolonization. All right, click and hit. Okay, so here's just some background about it. When World War II ended, the British and the French empires collapsed. Uh, the stress of World War II put these two empires to the brink, and the colonial people were demanding their independence. Um, well, Britain and France didn't want to just totally give up, so a lot of times they kind of held on as hard as they could. But this time, though, the Soviet Union is now providing military assistance to many of these former colonies. It's been like, hey, you want to be communist? Have some guns. Um, and they encouraged these countries to declare their independence from this NATO alliance, potentially ally with communism so the whole concept of decolonization is definitely rooted in the bigger themes of the cold war and uh as soon as these rebel movements are starting to get help from the soviet union then america is going to get involved and try to help the other side so it's just global positioning all over the dang place all right moving on so yeah and many people in the developing world even once they got their independence they started demanding land reform. Um, land is always a huge issue in so many of these uh, colonial disputes. Um, the Soviet Union tended to provide military assistance to those who desired redistributing land ownership, especially to break up kind of the uh, traditional monopolies that rich people have when it comes to land. Um, the USA tended to provide weapons to the rich landowning classes. Uh, this created hundreds of conflicts around the world, and the USA and the USSR are just going to get involved. Typically, they did not get involved with their military forces and their soldiers and their armies. Typically, it was just providing money and weapons and support for two sides in these kind of colonial civil wars. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a cool map. It shows you like the red are the countries that were kind of consistently communist, blue were consistently uh, capitalist, and all kinds of countries are kind of playing both teams in the gray there. So, yeah, it's it's a it was a wild period of world history, that's for sure. All right, and proxy wars. This is a big concept. So, there were a few times in uh, the Cold War period where American soldiers did get directly involved, and where Soviet soldiers did get directly involved. And uh, so, these proxy wars, it's sort of like you're having someone else fight on your behalf. And uh, in all these purple word example countries here, Korea, Vietnam, Cuba, Angola, Algeria, Sandinistas, Contras, and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, uh, in all of those situations, they were hugely impacted by this global war of capitalism versus communism, Soviet Union versus USA. But in none of those wars did American soldiers and Soviet soldiers ever directly shoot at each other. Uh, to the Korean War, a little bit, but that's a disputed point. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was just, uh, if the Americans were fighting people in Vietnam, then the Soviet Union gave the Vietnamese guns and weapons and support. If the Soviet Union is invading Afghanistan, America gave Afghanistan weapons and guns and support. So, yep. And so many of these, actually, is it true that I can say all of these wars? Eh, I'm going to do it. All of these wars were about creating the new kind of economic system or form of government in these newly independent countries in this decolonized world. Um, not all of these wars were like them fighting against their old imperial power, but it typically was this country is a brand new independent country. Are we going to go the capitalist road or the communist road? And whatever side they chose, they're going to piss off the other global superpower. Okay, and uh, the USA and the USSR constantly getting involved in all these conflicts around the world, just giving everybody more assault rifles and more heavy machine guns and more big, st big armaments. It's just going to result in higher and higher casualties and more and more deaths in these conflicts. All right, moving on. 
So here's a bunch of summaries of some uh, special events that occurred around the world during this period. I think I've got like three or four slides on this. And I'm just going to talk to you about some important historical characters. There can be questions about these people, so, so know them and know them well. All right, the first guy to talk about is Sukarno, and I think my face is totally covering up his face. Um, but he was the uh, leader of Indonesia during their struggle for independence. Uh, most of his young life, he fought against the Dutch. But as soon as the Japanese started doing their stuff in World War II, he actually allied with the Japanese. Um, but when the Japanese lost World War II and the Dutch started to come back, then he allied with the Soviet Union. Okay, eventually he did achieve independence. Uh, but he kind of snubbed the Soviet Union right at the end when he set up the non-aligned movement and he discouraged other countries from accepting aid from the USA or the USSR. And I know India really got into that too, but eventually just about every country kind of was a little more aligned with either the USA or the USSR. Uh, some countries played both sides, which I think is uh, the, the, the way to get a whole bunch of money from uh, these rich, super or powerful countries. All right, uh, another guy to talk about is Kowame Nakuma, uh, and here he is right here. Uh, he, or Nakuma? Yeah, I think I said it right. He was the leader of the Ghana independence movement. Uh, he spent 10 years in the United States, uh, rallied a bunch of help from African Americans, and he managed to achieve Ghana's independence from Britain. He tried to create this kind of concept called the United States of Africa, known as Pan-Africa. But the many different African countries didn't really agree with his terms, and a true Pan-Africa never happened. Um, but on a side note, there is something today called the African Union. It's sort of like a mini version of the United Nations, but just for African countries. And I think today the African Union is doing some good stuff. But they're still by no means politically united as much as the United States of America is. All right, moving on. All right, Gamal Nasser. Oh, man, and my face is covering him up again. Uh, Gamal Nasser, he advocated for an aggressive strategy to rebuild Egypt as a major power. Uh, he's kind of like the modern Muhammad Ali during Ottoman times. Um, and he also had kind of this global or unity concept called Pan-Arabism, uh, the United States of Arabs. That also didn't really work out. Um, but there are people who are still talking about it today because here in the blue, all of these countries are Arabic countries that all, you know, practice largely Sunni Islam and speak Arabic. So he's like, why can't we be one united country? Let's do it. Um, but uh, during his time in office, he actually got help from both the USA and the USSR, played both sides against each other, managed to dramatically improve Egypt. Uh, he did get involved in a couple wars, especially against Israel. Um, and I, I don't know if that'll even come up in, in AP World Curriculum. But uh, Nasser is definitely seen as a, a guy who really built up Egypt and made it a much more powerful country. Uh, Julius Nyerere, he was a communist revolutionary in Tanzania. Uh, he created this philosophy called Ujama. It's kind of this African version of communism, similar to Chinese communism. And at first he was getting help from the Soviet Union, but he continually defined communism in different ways. And he actually kind of insulted the Soviet Union so much they stopped working with him. Um, and uh, I think he's a great part of this bigger theme that communism around the world the soviet union was definitely the biggest country and the leading country of communism but other countries started to go down different paths and the soviet union kind of like disowned their versions of communism so uh we'll we'll explore that a little bit later all right moving on all right uh sermavo uh, bandakane uh she was the world's first female prime minister okay and i think my face is once again totally covering her face uh, in 1960, uh, she was the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, passed a lot of socialist policies. But uh, something that's not cool is she took rights away from the Tamil minority group in Sri Lanka, and they created a terrorist organization called the Tamil Tigers, and they fought against the government even all the way until like 2009. So uh, uh, overall, I think she is generally regarded as a good leader, but she has a mixed bag. But anyway, first female prime minister, that's cool. Um, another guy to talk about is Mengitsu Hale Miram. Uh, as a boy, he lived in the USA, experienced racism, bad. 
Um, and as a result of his experiences as a boy, he took the ideals of communism and racial equality, and he returned to his country of Ethiopia. While he was in Ethiopia, he allied with the USSR, and he ruled Ethiopia with extreme military force. Uh, he was later put on a genocide trial, but I think he was actually not convicted of genocide for some of the things he did in Ethiopia. Um, but uh, he, he definitely uh, turn, turned that country in a very different path. So that's a, a dude to know. All right. All right. Indra Gandhi. Oh, man, it, my face is covering her again. Uh, but Indra Gandhi is a really interesting person. Uh, no relationship to Mahatma Gandhi, a totally different family. Um, but uh, she was the prime minister of India for 24 years. I think there was a little break in there, though. And uh, she adopted new technologies for farming and did Soviet style five year plans to improve India's economy. Um, by a lot of accounts, she's like a thumbs up person for the country of India. Uh, she established policies that put high tariffs on foreign goods. She wanted everything to be made in India. She didn't want to buy nothing from the USA or the Soviet Union or China. She wanted India for the Indians. Um, and another huge change she did in her life was land reform. I said land reform is a big issue in so many of these countries. And uh, the, the thing is, India had surf style farms in the 1960s where there were these families who for as long as they knew their recorded history had been living on the same land. The land was always owned by this rich person and the rich person kind of took so much of the product that was produced on these, uh, this, the land farmed by these peasants. So these Indian people were like, we want to finally share the land. And uh, the Indian government uh, under Gandhi, she passed some laws saying that people could own a maximum amount of land. And if you owned any more uh, land than you were allocated, then these old rich landowning families had to donate their land to their traditional tenants who've been working for their families for, you know, so many hundreds of years. Um, and it's still a, uh, a process that's kind of getting worked out to this day. Um, it definitely pissed off the really rich people and the poor people really liked it. But then they're like, we want even more land. Um, so it's it's still kind of a mess. But it's, it's definitely uh, spreading the wealth out more in India and uh, improving people's lives in India overall. All right, moving on. So, um, and it is just a really important concept. Many of these new countries, especially in Africa, had borders that did not fit the cultural heritage of people who lived there. A lot of these countries declared independence based on the borders that Europeans drew on the maps for them. But Europeans had no understanding of the languages people spoke, of the religions people had. Um, so a lot of these countries were kind of declared independent prematurely. And I still think in the upcoming years, actually I am positive in the upcoming years, more and more countries will split, especially in Africa and Asia, as they're kind of now recognizing where the, the, the proper borders should be based on language, religion, and cultural heritage. Yes, so lots of problems. And uh, many of these wars get exploited during the Cold War by proxy wars. Uh, so those are, those are all happening too. Okay, so some resurgent countries in the world. This is a really cool concept. Uh, way back in BC times, there was a country called Israel and a bunch of Jewish people lived there and it was super cool for them. Um, it got taken out by the Roman Empire way back in the day, and the Jewish people continually had this desire to return to their ancestral homeland. Well, one of the first acts of the United Nations was to found the country of Israel. And we said, hey, Jewish people who survived the Holocaust, you got a land to call your own. Um, but the problem was there were a whole bunch of Muslim Arab people who lived there called the Palestinians. The Palestinians did not want to give up their land. And it is still a consistent problem to this day because Jewish people and Palestinian people are still fighting over the land in the Middle East. Um, oh, I spelled Israel wrong in that uh, document or that slide. Dang. Um, and anyway, the country of Cambodia emerged from French Indo-Chinese possessions and the Khmer Rouge attempted to recreate an agricultural communist society referencing the Khmer Empire. And I talked about this uh, group a little bit in my genocide unit in the, in the last uh, uh, slide. But this is just another example of a communist country 
that really kind of did communism in a very different way than what the Soviet Union intended. And as a result, they say, everybody who lives in the cities, you're worthless. We're all just going to go farm. And if you don't farm, we'll kill you. So it's pretty, pretty terrible stuff. All right, moving on. So here's some other independence movements that did not succeed, um, but they all were kind of a part of the Cold War. Uh, first one is the Bifra Separationist Movement in Nigeria. Bifra is this kind of southern region of the country of Nigeria. Uh, they have a special um, ethnic group there. I think they're called the Undongo. Ah, I should have written that on here. Um, but uh, they viewed themselves as having a very different culture, a very different religion, very different language. And they're like, we want to be our own thing. Um, their ind independent movement failed when the Nigerian army came in there, uh, killed their leaders, and forced them back into the country. Um, something that wasn't so violent what was what was happening in the country or in Canada to our north, uh, the province of Quebec. They have repeatedly, I think, on three different occasions in the last sixty years, had a referendum to potentially leave the country of Canada. Um, and each time they voted to <laughs> sate, that should say stay. Uh, but uh, it, every time they have a vote, it keeps getting closer and closer to the people of Quebec wanting to leave. So it is very possible that in recent, uh, in the upcoming years, uh, the people of Quebec could declare their independence from Canada because, hey, they speak French, they're Roman Catholic Christian, the rest of Canada, not so much. Um, another interesting independence movement that didn't succeed was a group called the Shining Path. They were a communist terrorist organization in Peru sponsored by the USSR, and they desired to achieve communism in South America through violence. And uh, people in Peru were constantly freaked out about these uh, people. And the group was majority women, which is a surprising thing too. Um, and the Shining Path still exists in 2021. They're not getting financial assistance from the Soviet Union anymore, but they're still around and still trying to do communism. I don't think they're as, as a powerful force as they used to be, though. All right, moving on. So all these new independence movements totally reshaped many societies around the world. The world in the year, what, 1980 was so different than the world in the year 1940. It can't be emphasized enough. Tons of more immigration around the world during this period. As all these countries are falling, uh, uh, declaring independence, many people are moving into their former colonizers' countries. Uh, a lot of the Algerian population moved into France. Today, France is like 25% Algerian. A lot of people in India and Pakistan move to the United Kingdom. Philippines, Korea, Vietnam gets huge immigration into the United States. And Turks move to Germany. I think the country of Germany is like 30% Turkish today. So all kinds of international movement to so much of a higher degree than it ever was before. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. So all this new immigration led to cultural conflict still visible in 2021. Yeah, it's true. That some people are, are still getting their, their new connections to, to immigrating around the world. All right, moving on. So who was America friends with? Okay, this is kind of an interesting slide because there were three really bad dudes who were in charge of uh, countries during the Cold War. And America was so vehement about not allowing communism to spread, we allied with these guys. And I couldn't tell you why, other than we just said, oh, hey, you're not communist? We'll give you money and weapons. Um, so all of these three were authoritarian style leaders who kept a tight grip on their country with American support. Uh, the first dude to talk about is Augusto Pinochet. Here's a picture of him down here. And uh, Pinochet was a hardcore ruler of Chile who arrested his political enemies and dropped them out of helicopters that were flying over volcanoes. Uh, that's like, if you throw someone in a volcano, pretty hardcore way to murder somebody. Uh, he stole $28 million for himself. He kept a really tight military rule in the country. But you know what? Chile never went communist. So there is that. Uh, Spain under Francisco Franco. Here's a black and white picture of him with his buddy Adolf Hitler. Um, in, in every way you can imagine, Francisco Franco was Spanish Hitler. He was officially a fascist. Uh, Hitler gave him military resources to help him get into power in the 1930s. 
Uh, thankfully, Franco was neutral during World War II, but after World War II was over, America's like, hey, you hate communists. We'll give you money. Um, Franco killed 100,000 people. He brutally suppressed the Basque and Catalonian peoples of Spain um, and really tried to like force people all to have this national Spanish identity. And largely today, he's viewed as just a terrible, bad dude. But he wasn't communist, so America helped him. Uh, Uganda under Idi Amin. Uh, Amin killed probably half a million people of ethnic minorities in his country. Um, but later, he actually betrays the United States, and he works with the Soviet Union and terrorist groups. So he was one of those guys who played both sides and kind of double-dipped into the, the resources of the superpower countries in the world. Um, but by all accounts, Idi Amin, terrible dude. Terrible. All right, and uh, the next part of this presentation, I'm just going to show you guys a modified version of what I do in my regular world history class and cover all these topics to finish up the Cold War. All right, that's it for me. Peace out.